Okay, so I'm not really used to speaking with a microphone, so let me know if I'm being too loud or too quiet, but I think it sounds fine. Okay. So yeah, this problem is about maximum matching. Um, it's kind of about like one core structure that's had like many different applications, so it's kind of an, a bit of an overview. And so some of that work was done by me, but a lot of the work in this talk was not done by me, it was done by other people, and specifically other people in this room. Um, and also the slides themselves were, a big chunk of them was stolen from Sepper. Um, so <laughs> you gave me permission like four years ago <laughs> for a different talk, so I, yeah. <laughs> the rule of thumb is that the nice slides are Sepper's and the less nice slides are mine. <laughs> okay, so, um, so in general, what is a common approach for dealing with graph problems? It's sparsification. So we're given a graph of G, and a sparsifier is just a sparser subgraph that preserves some nice properties about G. So I think the canonical example here is cut sparsifiers. This is like a really nice sparsifier where basically given any graph G, you can represent it with a sparse subgraph H that just captures essentially all of the cut information of G. But it doesn't just capture the minimum cut, it captures every cut. So whatever cut problem you're trying to solve, minimum cut, maximum cut, sparsest cut, doesn't really matter. You can just work with the sparsifier instead of the original graph. And that's gonna be faster because the sparsifier is sparse. So not for all problems do we have such nice sparsifiers. So for example, for shortest paths, the classic sparsifier is a spanner, which again preserves all shortest paths, but the approximation is worse. And there are also spectral sparsifiers, so there's kind of, for many problems, there are different kinds of sparsifiers. And for each problem, you need to develop your own sparsifier, and sometimes they'll be good, and sometimes they'll be less good. And so the orienting question of this talk is, there's like one problem that's really missing from this list. Like matching is another kind of core graph problem that everyone works on, but what would a good sparsifier for matching look like? And so that's what I want to talk about in this talk. Okay, so matching. I'm kind of assuming you've all seen this problem. You just have a graph, and you want to find a collection of disjoint edges. This graph is non-bipartite. I'll mostly be focusing on bipartite graphs just to keep things nicer. Um, and I'm going to assume that it's an unweighted graph. All edges have weight 1. And so just some notation I'll use throughout. Mu of g is the size of the maximum matching in g. So in that graph above, mu of g would be 3. In this graph I drew here, which doesn't have a perfect matching, so you can't match all the vertices, the best matching matches two edges. So here mu of g would be two. Okay, and mm of g is just gonna be like the actual edges in the matching. Okay, so what would be a good definition of a sparsifier for a graph? Like what kind of properties do we wanna preserve? So here's an option. Let's just say I want the sparse subgraph that has approximately the same matching size as G. So this is kind of a dumb definition. Can someone tell me why this is a dumb definition? What's like an obvious sparsifier you can use for this? The maximum. Yeah, the maximum matching itself is a sparse graph. It has exactly n edges, and it has the exact same match and ma maximum matching size. So this is not a very interesting sparsifier, and it also doesn't really help very much. So it's too easy, so it's not an interesting problem, but it's also not a very useful thing. And the contrast I want to make is that a cut sparsifier doesn't just preserve the minimum cut, it preserves all the cuts. Whereas this is preserving very little. Okay, so some other issues with it is it's not going to be robust. If the graph changes, if you, know, if you have a clique and you just have your sparsifier, which is a single matching, and then you delete that matching, then the graph is still basically a clique, but your subgraph is gone. So it's, it's not robust. And it's not composable and I'm going to remain vague about what this means in the whole talk, but I want to emphasize that even if in the end what you care about is maintaining a maximum matching, that's all you care about, it might still be useful to have an object which preserves more information than just the maximum matching. And the reason is that, you know, the sparsifiers are meant to be a general tool that work in many different settings. And so in particular, you want your sparsifier to work well in like the streaming setting and parallel settings and distributed settings and dynamic settings. And that is true of, for example, cut sparsifiers. But when you work in those settings, like let's kind of imagine a stylized version. You have, I don't know, a distributed algorithm. So your algorithm can't look at the whole graph all at once. 
Instead, it's going to be, you know, one part of the algorithm is going to be looking at this chunk, one's going to be looking at this chunk, one's going to be looking at this chunk, one's going to be looking at this chunk. Let's call these A, B, C, D. Now, for cut sparsifiers, if you compute a cut sparsifier for A and a cut sparsifier for B and one for C and one for D, and then you just kind of merge them, you'll get a cut sparsifier for the whole graph. That's what cut sparsifiers give you. So, but with matching, if you compute just the maximum matching for A and B and C and D, and then try to combine them, they won't combine well. And you will not get information that allows you to compute a maximum matching in the graph as a whole. So the point is that even if in the end all you want is a maximum matching for the whole graph, when you look at specific parts like A, B, C, or D, you want to preserve more information than just the matching. Because if you preserve just the matching, it won't mesh well with the other parts of the graph. OK, so this, not a good sparsifier. So what would be a great sparsifier? Here's what would be a great sparsifier. A great sparsifier would be that, let's focus on a bipartite graph, just to keep things simpler. A great sparsifier would be that basically for any subset of vertices I take here, and for any subset I take here, I want, so I have some you know, complicated graph in here, and I have some somewhat sparser like sparsifier the orange edges. And the property that I would really like is that if I focus on any S and T, then the maximum matching on the orange edges between S and T should be similar to the maximum matching in the original edges. So it kind of, it doesn't just preserve the maximum matching, it preserves the matching between all subsets. That would be great. That would be kind of like as strong as cut sparsifiers, loosely speaking. Um, but this is just not possible. So if you want a multiplicative approximation, it's completely impossible. In fact, even if you just want basically to differentiate 0 from 1. So you want the subgraph such that for any S and T that have an edge in the original graph, your subgraph also has an edge. That's impossible because if you just imagine a directed bipartite graph with some edges, you would need to keep every single edge in your subgraph. Because if there's some edge that you don't keep, well, then if you set this to be S and this to be T, then the matching between S and T in G is 1. You use that edge. And in H, it's 0. So there's no multiplicative approximation that you can get. You can get an additive approximation, but the additive approximation is really big. So this is basically gives you no information at all about small sets S and T. This only really gives you relevant information if S and T are very, very big, because your additive error is like half the vertices in the graph. Um, OK, so so this kind of this is basically too much to hope for. So where that leaves us is that we had option one, which is just not interesting. It's too weak. And option two, which is impossible. So we kind of want something in between. Right? We want a sparsifier that we do want it to preserve the maximum matching. That's kind of like a minimum thing we want. But we also want it to have nice properties. We want it to be robust. We want it to be somewhat composable. We want it to be easy to work with. Um, and a lot of these are vague. And they're kind of purposefully vague. Because I think that because we don't have like a perfect sparsifier, like a cut sparsifier, there isn't going to be one right sparsifier. You're going to have to compromise. And depending on what setting you're working with, you might want a different compromise. You might want to emphasize different properties. So I think there isn't going to be like one clear sparsifier that works for everything. But nonetheless, the point of this talk is to show that there is a sparsifier that does capture a lot of these properties pretty well and ends up having a lot of applications. Yeah? yeah for this like, uh, n over 2 additive possibility result, what does sparse mean in this context? Like in the previous slide? Um, oh, I see. I see. Well, you definitely can't have like n poly log edges. I think the provable thing, Sepper will correct me, is that you need like n to the 1 plus little o of 1 edges if you want to do better than that. Okay. Uh, and probably you need a lot more. It, de it depends on a combinatorial. It depends on Ruse's and variety graphs, which Sepper will talk about, like the exact density you need. Um, but n poly log edges is ruled out. And that's, I'm focusing on sparse. Like, yeah. OK. Um, so, OK, yeah. So, so the, goal, the, the point of this talk is to show a sparsifier which does have a lot of these properties. And as a result, is applicable to many different models. Um, to make things more concrete, I wanted to start by defining a particular model. 
not really because I think it's the most important one, but just because it's very concrete, and I think it's, it, it'll kind of be easier to think about sparsifiers if we focus on one concrete problem. So my, my goal now is I'm going to define a, the fault-tolerant model, and then I'm going to start by showing a sparsifier that's kind of weaker than the final sparsifier we're going to show. OK, so let's define this model. So here's the model. This is trying to capture robustness. So you have a graph G, and you want to create a subgraph H, and we're going to say that it's F tolerant if basically it still has a large matching, even after you've removed any set of F edges from the graph. So let me give a, it's sort of hard to come up with an example for this that really captures, that is small. But let me, here's the best I came up with. So this is my graph G. And let's say f equals 2. So I want the subgraph such that even after you delete any two edges from g, it's still a pretty good subgraph. And I want it to be smaller. So here is a subgraph that you could use in this case. It'd be these four edges. And I claim that, so this is h. The orange is h. And the yellow is the main graph g without h. And I claim that this is a two-thirds approximate sparsifier. Because, you know, for example, if you, let me get a third color for deletions. So, you know, if you delete these two edges, then you have, then basically the size of your matching is three and the <laughs> size of G is four, so this is still a good approximation. The more interesting case is if you delete these two edges, then Mu of h is now 2, because you've deleted two of the edges, and h is only has 2 left. But that's OK, because let me write it like this, mu of h minus f. But mu of g minus f, even though the original g had a maximum matching size of 4, the maximum matching size is now 3. Once you delete these two edges, the maximum matching in g is 3. So this is just to emphasize that when you delete edges, it might hurt g as well as f. And so the point is that you're still two-thirds approximate. Like h minus f is still a good approximation to g minus f. OK, so that's the definition of the model. And we want to come up with a subgraph that does this well. In your example, the, the set of f is just, the set of edges is just the maximal matching. Is it like common that the maximal matching is no, not there? No, that, that is not. Um, just a coincidence. Yeah, that's a coincidence. In fact, we'll be talking about how a maximum matching is an OK sparsifier, but not a great one. It's never like a subset of the sparsifier or something, or you can never just add it just in case, or I don't think it's a nice size, right? Sort of. Well, OK, so let's, I think, I think we'll, that question will be answered. So um, OK, so the first thing I want to say is that if you want to support f faults, well, then you really need like omega f edges, because otherwise the adversary could just delete all the edges in your subgraph, and you're left with nothing. So you need like more than f edges. OK, so we're going to sort of focus on the best robustness possible. So I'm going to, my goal is to show that for any f, and think of f here as large. f is bigger than n. So f is some large number. I want to show something that basically has the optimal number of edges, where it sort of has like just a fraction more than the number of faults. So I want to something as robust as possible, and now I want to figure out how good can I get my approximation factor to be if I demand this kind of extreme robustness. So these kind of problems have been studied in other problems a lot. And for matching, not as much. But so here's, here's what we have. OK, so let's talk about some, some options. Um, so let's talk about the failed option. That's option one, which is we're just going to set our subgraph to be a maximum matching in G. This fails for a really obvious reason, which is that we might want to be robust to many faults. Like again, think of f as bigger than n. Then if you just pick the maximum matching, well, you're clearly robust against that most n faults. So here's a second option you might consider. You might say, OK, I'm going to pick a maximum matching. And now I'm worried the adversary will delete the edges of that matching. And so to prepare for that, what I'll do is I'll remove that maximum matching and then compute a maximum matching in the remaining graph. So now I have my remaining graph. I compute another maximum matching. I add that to my sparsifier. I remove those edges. And now I compute another maximum matching. And I just keep doing this. So I kind of prepare myself by just repeatedly computing a maximum matching and removing its edges. And I do this until I have around f edges. 
So this is a pretty good sparsifier, but it's not perfect. So let's, let's talk about, when I first saw this sparsifier, I just kind of assumed it would work. It just seemed intuitive to me that if you keep layering maximum matchings, you're kind of prepared for everything. But it turns out you're not. So let's see why this only gets a one half approximation. So here is the example. So here's the original graph. So think of these as like big chunks of vertices. So these each have like n over 5 vertices. And this, when I draw an edge, this is refers to like a single matching. So this is basically just a single matching between this big chunk of vertices and this big chunk of vertices. And I have a single matching here. This is just the original graph. And then I have like a essentially complete graph here. So now let's look at what our algorithm is going to do. It starts by picking a maximum matching in the graph. So um, here's a maximum matching in the graph. It's this one. So it's going to start by picking this maximum matching, and I'm going to add these to h. Now what does the algorithm do? It basically says, OK, these edges are removed. I have some remaining graph, which is just a, x, and y. And now I'm going to compute a maximum matching in that remaining graph. So in the remaining graph, basically the maximum, there is no perfect matching. You either have to match, you basically get to match everyone in a to whoever you want. And so a maximum matching in this graph is just to match a to x. Now you remove those edges, and you compute another maximum matching. And again, your remaining graph is basically just ax and y, and so your second maximum matching might just be another matching between a and x, and so on. And so your subgraph might just look like this, where every time you pick another maximum matching, you just always pick one between a and x. And since you have so many edges between a and x, you'll always be able to find another maximum matching there. OK, so this is your subgraph, and let's see why it's not a good subgraph. Because now the adversary just has to delete like these n over 5 edges. No matter how big f is, all it has to do is delete these n over 5 edges. Because then what do you end up with? You end up with that, well, mu of g minus f, without these edges, you can still match all of a and y and all of x and x prime. So it's still like 2n over 5. But mu of h minus f, h is the orange graph, well, in h minus f, you don't have these edges. You basically only pick things around x. And so you, all you can do is match x. So this ends up being n over 5. So it's a 1 half approximation. OK. So you know, so the natural question is, can we do better than 1 half approximation? But before doing that, I actually want to show you a different 1 half approximation. And the reason is because. If you're willing to, like, the problem with the, the previous sparsifier I just showed you, one problem is that it's only one half approximation, but the other is just that it's kind of hard to work with. Like, it doesn't have a nice, clear structural definition. I've defined it only via, like, a complicated iterative algorithm. It would be very hard to prove properties about this sort of object. So kind of as a warm up, I want to emphasize that if all, if you're willing to settle for one half approximation, there is a very nice object that does that, that's, like, very easy to work with. So let's start with that. OK, and to define that object, I need to sort of differentiate these two things that I'm also hoping everyone knows about, which is that we have maximum matchings or optimum matchings, and then we have maximal matchings. So ma maximum matching has as many edges as possible, and a maximal matching is basically locally optimum, meaning that you cannot add more edges to the matching. So the classic example of, a, of this differentiation is that if your graph looks like this, then the maximum matching, the optimal matching, is of course the top, the horizontal edges. But this thing is a maximal matching, in that once you take this orange edge, you cannot add anything more to it. So it's maximal. And you can see here the maximal matching is half the size of the maximum matching, and that's tight. You can show that maximal matching is always at least half the size. OK, so the nice thing about maximality is that it's much, much easier to compute 
that are maximum matching. And the reason it's so much easier to compute is because it's defined in terms of these local constraints. So I kind of purposefully defined it that way up there and under the equivalent section where a maximum matching is just a matching such that for every edge that's not in your matching, it must be that one of its endpoints is already matched because otherwise you would add it. So that's just the constraint. You have a constraint on every edge. For every edge that's not in the matching, one of its endpoints is already matched. And so the point is you can immediately see that this would be much easier to work with and to kind of, you know, the details will depend on the particular model. And in this talk, I'm kind of trying to avoid going into details of particular models. <laughs> but at a high level, somehow, if you have a graph, and I'm trying to figure out, does this edge belong in the maximal matching? Well, I can just look, does it satisfy the constraint or not? If it doesn't satisfy the constraint, then I just add it to the matching. Like if, it's, if neither of its endpoints are matched, I add it to the matching. If it does satisfy the constraint, I do nothing. On the other hand, if you're trying to compute a maximum matching, and I'm trying to figure out, does this edge belong in the maximum matching, I basically need to look for augmenting paths. And so like, whether or not this edge belongs in an optimum matching depends on what's going on over here and what's going on over here. You'd have to look at the whole graph just to figure out whether or not this one edge belongs there. So that's kind of an, an intuition for why this object, maximal matching, would be much easier to compute in different models. OK. Um, and in particular, a uh, kind of um, orienting theme of this talk is that this is not just like a common barrier. This is the common barrier for matching. So basically, if you're talking about matching problems in like all the different models you can think of, there are obviously different models. You can get different approximations. Sometimes it's a third. Sometimes it's a half. Sometimes it's two thirds. But basically, you have like the world of approximation less than a half an approximation, or less than or equal to a half, really, an approximation bigger than a half. And these are like basically two different worlds. Like the kind of techniques you use in one world are very different than the kind of techniques you use in the other. And the reason is precisely because a maximal matching gives you a one-half approximation. Um, so what I want to start is by showing how to use these maximality constraints to get a nice sparsifier. And then to kind of somehow, based on those ideas, to figure out how to get a better object, which is actually able to go beyond 1 half. OK, so here is the object, my fault tolerance subgraph. And it's basically just maximality constraints. But I want it to be robust, right? Just the maximal matching has too few edges. I want to have a lot of edges so I can be prepared for a lot of faults. So I'm defining an object which is called a kernel, which is just a maximal beta matching. So essentially, all it is is I want a subgraph where now every vertex is allowed to have degree beta instead of degree 1. And I again want the property that basically I want, to, I want it to be maximal. I shouldn't be able to add more edges to the subgraph. And equivalently, what that's saying is that for every edge that's not in the subgraph, one of its endpoints should already be saturated, because otherwise I would be able to add it. So this is called a kernel. Um, but it's also just equivalent to a maximal beta matching. OK, so this has degree like around n beta. Sometimes it could be much smaller, but you can just think of this as having degree n beta. Every vertex has degree at most beta. The whole thing has, sorry, has n edges n beta. And one nice thing about this subgraph is this is very easy to compute. Uh, in linear time, right? You just use a greedy algorithm. You just go through the edges, and basically either they satisfy the, if they if neither endpoint is saturated, then you add the edge. OK, and what we're going to show is that this is a 1 half up, um, approximate fault tolerant. So even after you delete like an epsilon fraction of the edges in the subgraph, it still contains a 1 half approximation. To prove that, I want to define a variant of the kernel, which is just basically the same thing, but I allow some slack. So again, every vertex has degree at most beta. But now the maximality constraint is that for every edge that's not in the graph, one of its endpoints should be almost saturated. So it should have degree like beta times 1 minus epsilon. And the key lemma about kernels, and once we have this lemma, the fault tolerance is very easy to prove, is that if you have this kind of kernel with some slack, then it contains a 1 half approximation. Um, so this kind of, when I first saw this, I thought, like, well, surely this is obvious, because if a kernel is a maximal beta matching, 
then surely a maximal beta matching somewhere inside it contains a maximal matching, and that's a one-half approximation. I don't actually know how to prove that. I don't, like, although that seems intuitive to me, I'm not, I'm not sure that a maximal beta matching contains a maximal matching. So we're going to use a different proof, which is going to be a warm-up for the main object I'm going to show today. Okay, any questions about just the definition of the subgraph before I move on to prove things about it? Okay. So let's make some simplifying assumptions. I'm just assuming that I have a nice kind of bipartite graph that has n over two edges on each side. You don't need this assumption, but it helps. Okay, and so a classic theorem for matching, which I will quickly remind you of, is Hall's theorem. So Hall's theorem says that if you have this kind of bipartite graph, and you want to know, does this have a perfect matching? So Hall's theorem says that if you have, that it has a perfect matching only if the following condition holds. That for every set S in your graph, if you look at the neighborhood of set S in the graph, so like everything that S can reach, then you need to have that the neighborhood is bigger than the original set. And so one direction is obvious. If the neighborhood is smaller than the original set, as here, then it can't have a maximum matching. Because a maximum matching, right, it would need to match like one vertex. It would need to match every vertex in S. Um, but since n of S is smaller than S, you just wouldn't be able to fit all those edges. And so this is a contradiction because all of the edges from S are supposed to go to n of S. And the Hulse theorem says that the opposite is also true meaning that if every set S expands to a neighborhood that's as big, then you do have a perfect matching. Okay. And now we're going to use a slight generalization of this, which is generalized Hall's theorem. So I want a generalization that works when a graph does not have a perfect matching. Hall's theorem only talks about a perfect matching. We want something more general. So here is the generalization. So um, one second. I'm going to, uh, OK, sorry. So it's just hard because I can't see my own slides. Um, OK, so on the one hand, what we have is that for any set, for any set S, I claim that the expansion of that set is at least, um, we should have that the expansion is at least um, on the size of S minus N plus mu of G. And the reason is basically that the number of free vertices in the graph like, let's look at all the free vertices. They might not all be in S, but the worst case is that they're all in S. What is the number of free vertices? The number of free vertices is at most n minus mu of g. Or it's actually, yeah, the number of free vertices in that set is at most n minus mu of g. Um, and so the point is that all of the remaining vertices, this is s minus the free vertices. So that becomes s plus mu of g minus n. So that's exactly what we had here. So these remaining vertices all have to be matched. And so that means that the neighborhood of this set has to be at least as big as this number of remaining vertices. And so that gives us this bound. So this set also has to have size bigger than or equal to s plus mu of g minus n. Say that again? The green chalk is really hard to read. The green chalk is hard to read. OK. Or uh, white. OK, well, we'll figure out. I'll try to write in white then and only have figures in other colors. Yeah. Yes, there is. I apologize. Yeah, there is a divided by 2. I, I always am inconsistent here. Yeah, so these all have n over 2 vertices. Thank you. And am I wrong up there, or am I right? In, that's right. OK, good. Um, so the, 
so this is the easy direction. The, gener the harder direction is that basically this is tight, that there has to exist a set that there must exist a set S which contracts exactly by this much, essentially that where the additive contraction is this mu of g minus n over 2. And the proof is as follows, where what you do is you just add a new set v star. Imagine you have a new graph where you add a new set v star with um, n over 2 minus mu of g vertices. This graph has a perfect matching. So g star, mu of g star is equal to n over 2. And has a perfect matching as in you can match everyone on the left. Why? Because you just take, all, you take your maximum matching. You know that you have exactly this many free vertices, um, n over 2 minus mu of g. So free is less than. And you can match those free vertices to these new vertices you made here. So you're going to add these new vertices, and you're going to add edges from the new vertices to everybody. And so now you know that this new graph has a perfect matching. So what that means is that basically, if you, um, one second, sorry. Uh, so um, I'm, okay, I'm going to move here because I'm really disoriented without being able to see my slides. Okay, so what I wanted to say is, so I want to prove that there exists a set that contracts by this much. So let me, let me start over. Uh, so let's say for contradiction that for every set S, my contraction was actually smaller. So as in I, I didn't contract by this much, but rather I had a set that was one bigger. So it was like, for, so let's say that for every set S, I actually had that the size here is equal to s um, minus n over 2 plus mu of g plus 1. So this is for contradiction. Let's assume that for contradiction that every set could expand in this way. Um, then this would actually, the contradiction is that then if you add this new set of v star that I mentioned last time that's connected to everybody here, and you just gave it size um, n over 2 minus mu of g, but now minus 1, then this new graph would satisfy Hall's theorem. Because basically in every set s, the number of vertices that you're missing is like this factor, and that fits perfectly into here. So every set s in the new graph would satisfy Hall's theorem. But that means that the new graph has a perfect matching. So you basically took your graph and you added this many new vertices, and now your graph has a perfect matching. But that means that the number of free vertices you had is n over 2 minus mu of g minus 1, which doesn't make any sense, because the number of free vertices should be n over 2 minus mu of g, just by definition. Mu of g is the maximum matching. So the point is that somehow the size of the maximum matching exactly tells you the most contracting set. And we're going to use that in our proof. OK, questions about this proof? OK. So now we're ready to prove that this approximate kernel object contains a large matching. So the claim is that if I have this approximate kernel, it has a one half approximate matching. So let me start by doing this proof on the board. So we have a graph. And now we know by the generalized Hall's theorem that in H, there's a set S such that its neighborhood, n of s, 
is significantly smaller. And in particular, so these are going to be, this is going to be its neighborhood in H. So we know that if you look at just the subgraph H, then there exists a set S that contracts by a lot. And in particular, you have that N of S is equal to um, S plus mu of H minus N over 2. OK, and I'm going to make a simplifying assumption that the original graph has a perfect matching. You don't need the simplifying assumption, but it, it helps. It makes things a little easier. So we're assuming that mu of g is equal to n over 2. So what that means is that there must be a bunch of edges that are in g but not in h that leave this set. Because we know that in g, this set satisfies Hall's theorem. So we know that in g, there's some perfect matching from s. Some of that perfect matching might go into here, but some of that perfect matching has to leave here. And so we know that there is a set here that leaves my, that isn't adjacent in H, but is adjacent in G. And what is the size of this set? Well, the size of this set is basically um, n over 2 minus mu of H. Because that I sort of contract by this much, and so those extra vertices have to exist in G. OK, so let's, I now want to, um, I'm actually going to call this whole thing S. So what do I know? I know that I have this set S, which is kind of between both parts. And the size of S is, I apologize, I'll write it in white, is 2 times n over 2 minus mu of h. And the nice thing about s is that there are no edges inside h between vertices and s. In h, all of the edges leaving s have to go elsewhere. Like there are no edges in h that are inside s. Because that's how we defined s. Right? The whole point of s is that we first found this contracting set where in h the neighborhood is small. And then we said that in G, the neighborhood has to be much bigger. OK. So what is going to be the uh, outline of this proof? So let's look at S, and then let's look at all of the other vertices. So what is going to be the size of the remaining vertices? Uh, so I think it should end up being mu of h. Let me check that. So um, basically, so all of the edges leaving this set, they um, in G have to go. Uh, OK, um, one sec. Let me see what I have on my slides. OK. So yeah. Um, so what is our strategy going to be? Um, our strategies, so OK, we want to show that um, the matching in H is not too small. And the way we want to show that is that let's say that the matching in H was really tiny. Let's say mu of H was really, really small. Then S would be really big. And like if mu of H is small, like let's look at a world where mu of H is small, then this set S is really big because S has size like n over 2 minus mu of H. On the other hand, the neighborhood of S would have to be really small because there, somehow like, there, just, there wouldn't be many remaining vertices. And yet, we know that all of the edges of S all have to go into here. So this is, in theory, possible. You could have a big set S and a small set of edges that, where all of the edges go from S to the small set. 
But now what we're going to argue is that this is only possible if the degrees here, if the degrees on the remaining edges, on the remaining vertices, are much, much higher than the degree here. So if mu of h is small, then you have this huge set s, and all of the edges from s go to a tiny set, which implies that the degrees in the tiny set must be much, much bigger than the degrees in s. That's the only way that would be possible. And what we're going to show is that we're going to bound the degrees in s and, and hence show that, no, this can't happen. We're going to show that the degrees, that the average degree of s is relatively big compared to the average degree here, which means that the size of these two sets have to be comparable. OK. And that would show that we cannot have this case where mu of h is really small. So let's see, how do we argue that? So we have this set s. So I made this claim here that the average degree of s is like 1 minus epsilon beta over 2. Does anyone see why that is? So again, s is the set. These are the vertices that there's like a matching in. Right, These edges are the edges in g, but not in h. So. Why can we say that the average degree um, of this set is pretty big, of vertices in this set? Yeah? Each of the red edges is not in H, and so if one of the edges Exactly. Is... So here we're using the second property of the kernel, which is that every edge in the set is not in H, which means that one of its endpoints must have high degree. That's, that's what the maximal B matching, that's what the kernel promises. So for each one of these red edges, one of its endpoints has to have high degree. And so for each edge, the kind of average among its two vertices is beta over 2, or 1 minus epsilon beta over 2, because one of its endpoints has to have degree 1 minus epsilon beta. So we know that for the whole set, the average degree is 1 minus epsilon beta over 2. On the other hand, we know that for n of s, the average degree is at most beta, just because all vertices in the graph have degree at most beta. So you have a graph S. All of its edges go to some other set, N of S. And we know that the average degree in N of S is at most twice as big as the average degree of S. And so what that means is that this set can be, like that S can be at most twice as big as this set. If its average degree is only half as big, then it can be at most twice as big. So basically, what we have is that S is bigger than half of its neighborhood. So basically, we have this set S whose size is sort of has a minus mu of h. And we have the set N of S whose size is the maximum matching in h. And we're saying that they have to be somewhat similar sizes. And then we just kind of push it through. So we have that. Um, S is like half the size. And so now we combine our bounds for S. So S over 2, looking at number 2, gives us like n over 2 minus mu of h. And we said that that's at most n of S, which is mu of h. And so if you just do out the algebra, you get that it's a 1 half approximation. Yes, so beta does not really matter. Great, beta does not really matter. The beta is basically our fault tolerance parameter, where like if you, if you want to prepare for a lot of faults, then you had better set beta to be really big. But here we're not talking about fault tolerance. So for this structure, it will work for any beta. But the reason later we will kind of want to, want to set beta big if we want to prepare for many faults. So it's kind of a trade-off. If you want few faults in a sparse graph, you set beta small. If you want to capture a lot of faults, then you need to set beta big and you have a bigger graph. Yeah, so it's like a sliding parameter. Yeah? Uh, so when do we know that n of s is of size mu of h again? Oh, right. I didn't say that, and I myself somehow got lost in the algebra. So give me a second and let me say why that would be the case. Um, so. Uh, yeah, sorry, I, I thought I knew this and then I'm some, somehow lost it. So just give me 30 seconds. Um, I, 
I think it's just because like, uh, like all of the remaining vertices, like the size of S is um, n minus 2 mu of h. And so basically like this set, so this, the whole size of S is like all the vertices minus 2 mu of h. And then basically if you do the algebra like mu of h, this is another mu of h, and this is another mu of h. But s is only, like this set s, all of its edges come from here. Like there are no edges from here to here, right? That's somehow, uh, so like this neighborhood is kind of, it's half of the remaining vertices are incident to here. It's like this half, whereas this half is not. So you have two mu of h remaining vertices, and you can kind of easily do out the algebra to see that it's like half are on one side and half are on the other. And so it's incident to half of those. OK. So this is the proof that the kernel contains a large matching. Let's see why that shows us that it's also fault tolerant. OK, so this is again my kernel keeping the definition. And I'm going to assume now that the graph has a perfect matching and also that even after you delete a bunch of faults, it still has a pretty big matching. You don't need this assumption, but it just makes the proof a little easier. So I want to claim that if you start with like a perfect kernel where epsilon is zero, so it's just like an exact maximal B matching, then you can delete a lot of edges. So basically n beta times some constant, and you still have a large matching. So your whole graph has like n beta edges. And I'm deleting just n beta times a constant, and it'll still be good. OK, so what is the intuition behind this proof? So it's, it's a, um, the proof is really simple once we accept that an approximate kernel contains a large matching. The intuition is this. I want to claim, I basically want to claim that h minus f is a, still a kernel for g minus f. That even after I delete edges, whatever I have remaining still has the kernel properties. That's not 100% true, but this is like kind of true. So let's see why that would be. So let's look at some edge. So what is the kernel property? The first kernel property says that the graph is a kernel if all the vertices have low degree. All the vertices in h over f, h minus f, are still going to have low degree. Because the original graph h has low degree, has degree less than beta. Deleting edges will only help that. So the first property trivially still holds. The second property, let's consider an edge. So the second property says that if I have an edge that's in g but not in h, and I look at, then one of these vertices has to have high degree in h. So let's say it's this one. So let's say we have like uv, and let's say that v has high degree originally. Right? That must be the case, because we know originally we had a kernel. Now, the worry is that in h minus f, this is no longer true. But what would it require for this to no longer be true? Well, what would require is that the bad case is if the degree of h minus f of v is less than beta times 1 minus epsilon, that it's very small. But what that means is that the adversary who's deleting edges must have deleted a lot of edges around here. That's the only way in which this edge can become bad, is if the adversary specifically deleted edges around the vertex v. That can happen. And so it is possible for the adversary to ruin this one edge. But what I want to note is that basically to ruin a single edge, the adversary had to really focus around one vertex. And the adversary isn't going to be able to do that for all the vertices. It just doesn't sort of, it only gets like a n beta epsilon deletions. And it just doesn't have enough deletions to delete a significant fraction of edges from every vertex. And so to kind of follow this intuition, we're going to define a vertex to be good if the adversary does not delete too many edges from it. If the adversary deletes like less than an epsilon over two fraction of the edges, then we say it's good. And we say it's bad if the adversary really went all in on that one vertex and deleted like a bunch of the edges incident to that vertex. 
And then we're basically going to define G good to be just the graph. So we basically we have our graph G. And the intuitive definition of G good is just we're going to like erase the bad vertices. And then the remaining graph we're going to call G good. There's a slight technical thing, which that's basically the definition of G good, but I'm also keeping edges that, like, if there were edges between the bad vertices that were actually in H, like if there was an edge in H but from a bad vertex, I will keep that. I'm going to keep all of H, but other than that, I'm basically just keeping the good vertices. We'll see in a second why you need that technical thing, but intuitively you can just think of G good as just the good vertices. OK, so note that G good still contains a large maximum matching. That basically, even after you remove these bad vertices, the maximum matching you have remaining is large. And the reason is that the number of bad vertices is very small, right? Because to make a vertex bad, you need to delete like a um, two beta over epsilon uh, edges. Uh, sorry, epsilon beta over two edges. But your total um, supply of edges that the adversary has is like, there's a much smaller constant. It's like epsilon squared over 200. So basically, only like um, uh, less than an epsilon fraction of your vertices become bad, significantly less than an epsilon fraction, something like epsilon n over 100. And the reason for that two there is because every edge contributes to two vertices. But yeah. So you have few bad vertices. So most of your vertices are good. And this is where we also are assuming that the maximum matching itself has size like at least n over 10. Right? That was like the simplifying assumption up above. We're assuming that even after you delete edges, you have a maximum matching of size like n over 10. And we only like n over 100 vertices are bad. So if we just remove the bad vertices, we still have a large matching. OK. And so what that means is that even after you delete f, g good has a large matching. So basically, we can ignore the parts that aren't good and focus in on G good. And what I want to show is that no matter that even after you delete edges, H over F is still going to be a kernel. Right? So here I said it's kind of true. And so really what I meant is for bad vertices, this might be false. But if you remove the bad vertices, then the remaining graph is a kernel. And that's good enough, because basically if, if H is a kernel for G good, well, G good already has a very large matching, so being a kernel for G good is like just as good as being a kernel for the whole graph G. OK, so how do we prove this? It's exactly this proof. Right, so um, again, the first property is clear. All of your degrees are small. And the second property is if you have an edge, right, you want to show that for any edge that's in G but not in H, but now it's going to be in G good but not in H, one of the endpoints still has large degree. We know that in the original graph, there was an endpoint with large degree. And we also know that these endpoints are good. And so what that means is that this second case cannot happen. That degree, if the degree in H is big, then the degree in H minus F is still going to be big because it's a good vertex. And so the property is satisfied. OK. So the reason I wanted to show this proof is um, partly as a warm-up, because it's going to be similar to the more complicated proof we're going to do. But also to kind of emphasize that this kernel, it has two nice properties. The first is that it's sort of very easy to define, and it has these totally local constraints. And local constraints are kind of really nice to work with. And then a second thing that we just showed about it is that it's robust. Even after you delete a lot of edges, you still have a kernel. And I think what this proof highlights is that those are kind of stemming from the same thing. The robustness is basically coming from the local constraints. Because the key thing about this proof is that because your constraints are local, we said that, OK, if we have some edge, we know that originally its degree in H has to be big. Right? That, that's what the kernel promises us. 
And now the point is that the adversary could break this constraint by deleting edges, but because your constraints are local, in order to break this constraint, the adversary has to delete edges specifically around here. So essentially when the adversary deletes edges, it only breaks a small number of constraints. So when you have global properties, then deleting a single edge might kind of break all of your constraints at once. But if everything is localized, then deleting a single edge only breaks a single constraint. And so the adversary just cannot break too many constraints. And so the point is that having this kind of hyperlocality also just generally leads to robustness. This is not a black box claim. I'm not saying they're the same thing, but they are very related. And I think that this proof shows that. Yeah. Say that again? The constant 1 over 200 can be replaced by a arbitrary constant. Um, well, so that constant was related. This is kind of a slightly, um, like, the, this proof is simpler than the real proof because I made the simplifying assumption that the maximum matching has size n over 10. So in the, the proof the way I made it, if in the simplifying assumption I instead said that mu of g minus f has size n over 300, then my constant would have to drop, which is bad, obviously. Like in the real proof, you're like, so somehow this, that's why this proof really only works under this assumption. Um, so in the real proof, you'd kind of have to have a more fine-grained proof that works even if your maximum matching size dropped by a lot. I'm not going to show how to do that. I can leave it as an exercise. It's not, it's not very difficult. OK. Other questions? This kind of ends the warm up part of the talk. OK. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry. I forgot. The, the last stage is basically, yeah, if h, of, h minus half is a kernel, then it's like one half the size of g good. And so that's pretty much the size of g. OK, so what's our summary so far? We have this definition of a kernel. We showed that it contains a one-half approximate matching. And we also showed that, OK, the nice thing about it is that it has local constraints. And that leads it to be robust. It leads it to be easy to compute. It's easy to compute in many different models. So it's a pretty good sparsifier. It has many of the nice properties you want from a sparsifier. But it has a really big problem, which is that it cannot get beyond the one-half approximation. And kind of as I said before, in the world of matching, getting beyond the one-half approximation is often the key question. And so kernels have not actually seen that much application just because in many settings, computing a one half approximation is really easy. You don't need a kernel. You don't need anything. You just kind of do it. Computing a maximal matching is easy. There are a few settings like dynamic where even a one half approximation is hard to compute or like it's tricky and then you can use a kernel. But for the most part, if you're stuck at one half, then it's not going to be that useful. So what we want is we want a subgraph which is nice the way a kernel is nice. We want it to also have these kind of local constraints. We want it to be uh, robust in the same way. But we want it to somehow go beyond this one-half approximation. And so that's what we're going to do. And let me, before I define the object, I want to give a little bit of intuition for it. So let me start by giving an example of a kernel and why it breaks down, or why it's only one-half approximate. So I drew myself a graph here. So here is a graph. So I'm just going to set like beta equal to 2 for this graph. So I'm going to have eight chunks of size n over 8. And this is what my graph is going to look like. I'm going to have. So two edges means I have two matchings. Remember, an edge is just like a matching between these two chunks. So my graph looks like this. That's my graph. And then my kernel looks like this. So then. My degrees become 2, my degrees in H become 2, 0, 2, 0, 2, 0, 
0, 2. Can you see this color OK in the back? OK. So you can check that this is a kernel. Like, for example, this edge I'm not adding, and that's legal because one of its endpoints has degree 2. You can also see that this only gets a one half approximation. You're like basically only matching these vertices and these vertices and not matching any of the others. So how might you want to go about fixing this? The problem with this kernel is that it's somehow emphasizing some vertices more than others. It's not spread out enough. So what you would like is to balance the degrees more. You would like to say like, OK, I could sort of, um, what I could do is, I could, for example, add this edge and add this edge and remove this edge. And then my degrees, this, this 0 will become a 1, and this 0 will become a 1, and the 2s will remain the same. So I'll kind of, the degrees will become more balanced. Rather than having 0s and 2s, I'll try to bring everything up to have the same degree. And that will also simultaneously lead to having a better matching, because adding these two edges has now increased the size of my matching. So at least from this example, it seems that if we could somehow balance the degrees more, we might have a larger matching. Now, this might not be that convincing because it's just one example. But let me kind of give another argument for why we want to balance degrees, which is that let's go back to our proof for why a kernel had a good approximation. Right? And what we said is that basically, what is a kernel? We said that in, we, can find this we can find this set S, this one here, such that all of the edges of S go to the set N of S. And we said that the size of N of S is like mu of H. Right? And we said that, OK, if H is too small, we have a contradiction. Because if H is really small, then this set is big, this set is tiny. But the degrees here can't be, but this set can't be tiny because the degrees between these two sets are somewhat similar. That was our argument. So we said because the degrees are somewhat similar, these two sets have to be about the same size or within a factor of 2. And so mu of h has to be pretty big. But the reason that it wasn't that good an approximation is because if you remember, there we ended up with that the average degree of n of s was actually twice as big as the average degree of s. That's the best we could show in a kernel. And that's tight. You could show examples where they, like in this construction, if you look at this set, the average degree here is twice as big. The average degree here is beta. And the average degree here was beta over 2. And that means if the average degree here is twice as big, that means that this set might be half as small. And that was bad for us, right? Because this set is basically measuring the size of h. This set is like measures n minus h, and this set measures mu of h. So if this set is small, that's bad for us. So we would get a stronger bound if we had that. Sorry, there should be a 2 here. So basically, what made our bound bad was that the degrees here were higher than the degrees here. And if we could somehow come up with a subgraph that prevents that from happening, that forces the degrees here to be about the same as the degrees here, then the same proof as we had before would go through with a better constant. And we would beat the 1 half approximation. So my goal is going to be to try to define a subgraph which balances degrees in this way. OK, so let's define the subgraph. So I'm just going to go ahead and define it right away. The constraints are. So the following. So we have a subgraph H. We say that it's a beta EDCS. EDCS stands for Edge Degree Constraint Subgraph. It's, I regret the name. I wish I had a more snazzy name, but this is the name in the paper. So that's what I'm sticking with. OK. So um, edge constraint we'll see in a second, because you have constraints on the edges now. So the first constraint is that for every edge that's in the subgraph, the sum of the degrees of its endpoints is at most beta. So this is, in a kernel, we just said every vertex had degree beta. This is a s more strict constraint. Right? This is saying you cannot have an edge between two vertices, both of which have degree beta. Rather, for every edge, the sum of the endpoints of the degrees have to be at most beta. And note that those blue lines are representing, so we're looking at the red edge. And we care about the degrees in the subgraph. We care about the degrees in H. And we want the sum of those degrees to be at most beta. OK, similarly, if you look at an edge that's in G but not in H, then again, we're going to look at the degrees in H. Those are the blue edges. And now we're saying that for any edge that's not in the subgraph, in the kernel, we said one of its endpoints has to have a large degree. 
And here we're going to talk about the sum of its endpoints. So it's very similar to kernel constraints, but kind of rather than having like constraints about one vertex degree, we sort of have a constraint about the sum of the degrees. OK, so that's the whole subgraph. And I'm going to show that if you have any, any such subgraph, actually contains a 2 thirds approximate matching rather than a 1 half. So a few things I want to say about the subgraph. On the one hand, it's clearly nice in that it is quite simple. Like the constraints are barely more complicated than the kernel constraint. You just have a constraint on each edge. It's local. The constraint on each edge only cares about the endpoints of the edge. It doesn't care about anything else. Um, OK. It's simple. I recognize it might not immediately be intuitive. It's probably not. Like you're probably looking at this and you're like, OK, I can see they're simple, but I don't really get why these are the right constraints. And I don't have a great one minute answer for you for why these are the right constraints. You, you just kind of play around with it and you develop an intuition for it. I left a bunch of exercises. Those will help you develop an intuition. But let me give a very vague intuition, which is that, as I said before, it's trying to balance the degrees. And let's kind of see that in action, where essentially, if you have, let's say you have like, let's say you have something where the degree here is 2 beta over 3, the degree here is beta over 3, and the degree here is beta over 6. And let's say that this edge is um, not in H, so it's a dotted line, and this edge is in H. So this is not, this is going to violate my constraints because this thing here is adding up to too little. Beta over 6 plus 2 beta over 3 is adding up to way less than beta. So what's going to have to happen is that you're going to have to add this edge into the graph, into H. But once you add this edge into H, this becomes too big, and then you have to delete this edge from H. Because now this thing is adding up to beta plus 1, which is violating the first property. And so you have to delete this edge. And so now, basically, what happened is that your new constraint, your new degrees, are slightly more balanced than they used to be. So essentially, yeah, these EDCS constraints, what they're doing is they're forcing you, when possible, to change the subgraph so as to make the degrees more balanced. It's not always possible to have totally balanced degrees. It might just be that some parts of the graph you need to have high degree, and some part you, you can't. But they're kind of forcing you, when possible, to balance the degrees. And we kind of just discussed why balancing the degrees would be good. OK, so this is our subgraph. I'm basically going to keep this is going to be the beginning of every slide from here on out. And we're going to try to prove things about it. So the first basic thing is that it has max degree beta, just like the kernel. So if beta is small, it's sparse. And you can also show that it always exists. And it exists even if your slack is just like 1. So the kind of perfect IDCS is one where property 1, everything is less than beta. And property 2, everything is bigger than beta minus 1. You do need that little bit of slack. Otherwise, it might not exist. But as long as you have that additive slack of 1, you can prove that it always exists. If we have time at the end, I will show you why. OK, so for every graph, you have a subgraph with these properties. And the key lemma is going to be to show that this subgraph contains a 2 thirds approximate matching. And this has kind of proved that it's several iterations. It's been proved for bipartite and non-bipartite graphs. Um, so I'm mostly going to be focusing on kind of the proof similar to the second one, the 2019 proof. OK, so in order to prove this, the main thing we're going to need is essentially it's going to be almost the same proof as we had for the kernel except for this part here, where I said that we're going to want to make a different, we're going to want to prove that this is no longer possible. We want to show that we're no longer going to have a case where this n of s is way bigger, like double the degree of here. We want to show that the degrees are basically equal. So let me state the lemma that's saying this. So this is the degree lemma. So I'll draw it on the board. The degree lemma is basically saying that Look, if I have a, some set S where the average degree of S is some A, and then I, um, I have another set, and all of the edges from here go to B, um, and the average degree of B is B. 
then the claim is basically that um, B is less than or equal to beta minus A. And I think the way to think about it intuitively is that if I have A around beta over 2, which that's kind of the perfect degree in an EDCS. So if you look at the EDCS constraints, if everybody has degree beta over 2, that's, then everything is satisfied. Because then all edge degrees add up to beta, and all your constraints are automatically satisfied. So somehow the perfect EDCS is one where everything has degree beta over 2. And the point is that this, what this degree lemma implies is that if A is beta over 2, then B is also going to have to be at most beta over 2. Right, because it's just saying B is beta minus A. This, the intuition for this proof is really simple, which is that it only use, the whole proof only uses property one of the ETCS. It just uses the property that for every edge, the endpoint degrees sum up to at most beta. And all the, the intuition for the proof is just like, well, okay, if the average degree in here is A and the average degree in here is B, then the average edge between these two things, let's kind of like just focus on some edge that's the average edge. Well, that edge has degree A here and degree B here. And then the first property of the EDCS tells you that A plus B is less than or equal to beta. So that's the intuition for the proof. Um, this is not formal because just because the average degree here is A and the average degree here is B does not mean that there's an edge where one endpoint has degree A and one endpoint has degree B. Those were just averages. Um, so there is a more complicated proof that kind of shows that you can basically, you can find an edge, like there has to be at least one edge that looks like that. Um, I have this proof out and I am not going to go through it because it's really boring. It's, it's just like Cauchy-Schwartz basically to show that the average is representative of what, like n at least one edge is as bad as the average is basically the point of the proof. Yeah. Can you find that edge? That no, it doesn't. It doesn't directly show that. No, it, because I mean, I think you can show that you have something like it. Like, it can't be the case. Okay, yeah. The answer is that it doesn't show that because it it just sort of aggregates everything together. But I think spiritually, the point of the proof is that you can't have like all of your edge degree be kind of worse than what the average should look like. Um, I am, yeah, I think, I don't think it's a particularly instructive proof, so I'm not going to go through it. Um, okay, so with that, with this degree lemma in mind, let's go ahead and prove our key lemma. So here's the key lemma. And the proof is really the same. My drawing here is a little messy, so I'm just going to very quickly redraw the drawing, hopefully do it better this time. So right, the proof is basically that let's say that mu of h is small. Then we have some set here, some set s, um, or let's actually call it a, I'm going to reserve S for something else, such that N of A is significantly smaller in H. So we said that in H, this is going to be something like A plus mu of H minus N over 2. That was our generalized Hall's theorem. That if your matching is not perfect, then there must be a set that basically contracts by the number of free vertices in your matching. And so then we said that, OK, in A, in H, sorry, this set is contracting. But in G, we have a perfect matching. So in G, this set is not contracting, which means that basically there has to be a whole matching from here that goes to like the parts that aren't used by H. And so I'm going to call this my set S. And what is the size of this thing? Well, the size of this thing is precisely n over 2 minus mu of h. It's like the number of edges you were missing in h, they do have to exist in g. And similarly on this side.
So we have this set S here, whose size is 2 times n over 2 minus mu of h. And now, and we know that all of the edges from this set go to the outside, which again has size mu of h, just as before. But now let's look at the average degrees here. We know that the degree in the average degree of s is at least beta times 1 minus epsilon over 2. Why? Exactly for the same reason as in the kernel. All of these edges don't obey, uh, sorry, all of these edges are not in H, so they have to obey property 2. So for all of these edges, the sum of the endpoints is like beta times 1 minus epsilon. So for every two vertices, the sum of the degrees is beta times 1 minus epsilon. So the average degree is beta times 1 minus epsilon over 2. And here comes the one real difference, which is that now we have the set n of s. And I'm going to draw it bigger, because it has to be bigger. And we know that d of n of s by the degree lemma is also is less than or equal to beta over 2. Ignoring epsilons, if this degree is beta over 2, then our degree lemma said that like b is at most beta minus a. So if one side is beta over 2, the other side can be at most beta over 2. And so it's exactly the same proof as before, except that now this set has the same degree as here. And so that means that the neighborhood has to actually have the same si size as the original set. And again, that gives us a better bound on the matching because the neighborhood is basically judging the size of the matching. So we have exactly what we had before. We have the set S. We have these two sizes. But now the average degrees are approximately the same. OK, that should be a, approximately less than or equal to. There's some epsilon slack there. And so the point is that if you have a set S where all of the edges from S leave go to N of S, and, but the average degree here is the same as the average degree here, then they must have the same size. So basically what you have is that uh, S is actually less than N of S. And then you just plug in your bound for S, which was this 2 times N over 2 minus mu of H. You plug in the sound bound for N of S, which is mu of H, and you just rearrange. I think that, no, I think so. The first property gives you the degree lemma. The reason you need the second property, yeah, exactly. I mean, yes, I think that the first property, if you replace the first property with the degree lemma, that would be good enough. But in some sense, the, like, I think they end up being kind of the same thing. Uh, I mean, yeah, the first property implies the degree lemma, and I. I guess my question is does it go the other way? Right. Um, I am not sure. I didn't think about that. I mean, in some sense, as a constraint in your object, you would rather have this than the degree lemma. Because the degree lemma, if you wanted to verify it, you would have to look at every set, whereas this is very easy to verify. So that, that's kind of, yeah. Other questions? This is basically, the, this is kind of the proof of the main property of this object. So the takeaway is basically we have an object that has relatively nice, simple local constraints, and yet it's able to get a better approximation of 2 thirds. And we're going to show in the rest of the talk kind of that because it has these nice constraints, it, it's not a perfect matching sparsifier, but it has some of the properties that you would want from a matching sparsifier, and hence ends up being useful in a lot of applications. But kind of be, before I do that, let me know if there are questions about the proof itself. Yeah? For alternative matching, is there any known lower bound? Which is yes, it's tight. Uh, Sepper will talk about that. Yeah, uh, I'll, I'll mention that in a second. Yeah. Yes? Did you discuss how to find heads? How what? Uh, how to find epsilon EDC as like? No, I did not discuss how to. I didn't even prove that it exists. I said, like, if you have a subgraph with these properties, like, for all you know, it doesn't exist. If I have time, I'm worried I won't. You can also talk to me afterwards, and I'm happy to, yeah, show you why it has to exist. OK. So. We have this subgraph. 
we said that any such subgraph contains a two-thirds approximation. That's tight. You can draw an EDCS that contains exactly a two-thirds approximation. Um, I originally was going to draw it on the board, but I decided it better left as an exercise. This is a great way to like get an intuition for what's going on with the EDCS. So I have like a list of exercises um, that should be like on the website of the workshop, and this is going to be one of them. Okay, and as I said, this kind of it has local constraints, and as a result, it's going to have some other nice things. So it's going to be robust in the same way a kernel was, and it's also robust to random sampling. It's somewhat easy to compute, though not that easy. Uh, it's somewhat composable, so it's, it's a pretty good sparsifier. And it's good enough to get a lot of applications. So basically, there are a bunch of applications where it's easy to get a one-half approximation, but hard to do better than a one-half approximation. And so there are a lot of different settings in which the way in which we end up doing better than one-half is by using the EDCS. So it's especially been used in dynamic algorithms, but it's really like been applied to a bunch of different things. I should say this is not like one paper that gets all of this. Because the EDCS is only kind of easy to work with. So in a lot of these settings, it's like you can't just plug in the EDCS and get what you want. In a few of them, you can. But in a lot of them, it's, for example, like computing the EDCS and that setting is difficult. And so you need like new properties or new constructions or new techniques. So there's a lot of new ideas hidden in these papers of kind of how to make this object more manageable. But at bottom, all of these papers, the basic idea is you have your graph G, you compute an EDCS H, and then that gives you a sparse graph that has a large matching, and then you just compute a matching in H. OK, so I want to focus on a few of these applications for the time I have remaining. How much time do I have remaining? Oh, not long at all. OK, <laughs> good. OK, well, then I will try to go fast. OK, so. Uh, there are many other modules of uh, Aaron's presentation that ha haven't been presented yet. So may I ask if the remaining part is technically dense as so far? Or no, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip. I think I can skip all the, the, yeah, I think I can skip the technically dense part. Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, maybe you still like. Okay. Um, so for the rest of the talk, I want to, yeah, talk about at a very high level some ways in which you apply the EDCS. Each of these applications is like, usually a paper of its own that has to deal with various complexities. So I'm not going to go into the details. I also don't really want to define all these different models. So I'll keep it at a pretty high level. So first off, fault tolerance. I have a proof here, but because I've taken up too much time, I'm going to keep it shorter and just say that it's exactly the same proof as we saw for kernel, where you have H and you have your properties. So if you have an edge that's in H, I'll draw that in, say, orange. So if this is an edge in H, well, then the first property of the EDCS is that the endpoints has to sum to less than beta. And that will still be true. right? In H minus F, your degrees only drop. So everything is good. Now, what if you have an edge that's in G minus H? Well, we know that in H, these degrees satisfied the property. So they were like up to beta minus 1. And the point is that the only way in which it can stop satisfying this property is if the adversary deletes a lot of edges around V and a lot of edges around U. Because you have this slack, right? You now, in once you delete edges, you want it to now be bigger than beta times 1 minus epsilon. So you have like a slack of epsilon beta. So the only way that adversary could mess up this edge, this edge constraint, is if they deleted like epsilon beta edges around u and v. And now we have the same argument as last time, where we say that a vertex is good if the adversary deleted less than like epsilon beta over two edges. And we say that most vertices are good. So if you throw away the bad vertices, the remaining vertices are good. And for the good vertices, the degree of u and v didn't change very much, so it's still going to be bigger than like beta times 1 f minus epsilon. So it's really the exact same proof and highlights the same thing, that if you have these very local constraints, then things tend to be pretty robust. OK, so I'm going to skip over the details because they are the same. OK, so let's talk about other applications of EDCS to various models. So one is dynamic matching. It's been used here a lot in like a lot of different contexts. I'm just going to give one of them, the kind of most basic one. And this was actually the original motivation for this structure. 
So what is dynamic matching? You have a graph. The adversary inserts and deletes edges. And your goal is to maintain an approximate matching at all times. Um, and the update time is like the time if the adversary changes an edge, it's the time you need to change your matching. So some classic algorithms are the trivial algorithm is every time the adversary um, changes an edge, you just recompute the matching. It's not really order m update time. It's like, oh, hat m, you use this new max flow algorithm to compute an exact matching after every update. And basically, you can show that if you're willing to settle for an approximate matching, you can get a better update time of root m. And this is a perfect example of a problem where if you allow a two approximation, you suddenly get a constant uh, update time. It's not a trivial algorithm. It's quite complicated. But it is basically trying to break the one half approximation requires a very different set of techniques. And so what we show using the EDCS is you're kind of getting a trade-off between these two, that you could get like a 2 thirds approximation with running time that's kind of between the 1 minus epsilon and the 2 approximation. So let me give the outline of how this is done. So our goal is to get this update time of like root m over n. And we're going to use this subroutine, which is a very simple subroutine, which just says that if your graph has max degree delta, then you can just maintain a maximum matching in the subgraph and update time order delta. So here's going to be our framework for the dynamic algorithm. We're going to maintain a beta epsilon EDCS in the graph. I'll set beta in a second. And we'll show that you basically you can do this in time m over n beta. And on the other hand, we're going to maintain a matching inside the EDCS. So essentially what's going on is that you have a graph, G, and you want to maintain a matching M. Maintaining M and G directly turns out to be hard. So what you do is you kind of have this intermediate step of you're going to maintain your EDCS H. So now every time that you update an edge in G, that's going to make some changes to h. And so you sort of make some changes to h so that it's still always in EDCS. And then every time you make any changes to h, you also maintain your matching m inside the EDCS. So you're not trying to maintain a matching in the original graph g. You just only maintain it in the EDCS. And how long is that going to take? Well, the EDCS has degree beta, max degree beta. Just that that's property 1 ensures max degree beta. And so maintaining the matching in the EDCS, you only need update time beta by our low degree subroutine. There's one subtle thing you have to worry about, which is that in theory, it could be that one change in that basically, what does it mean that it has update time beta? It means that every time you make a single change to H, you need beta time to update the matching. There is a worry that a single change to G could cause many changes to H, which in turn could cause, and each of those would require time beta. But you can show that doesn't happen. You could show that a single change to G, like on average, causes just a constant number of changes to H. OK, so this is kind of the basic framework. And so balancing beta between those two, you're going to get a good update time. And the approximation is basically that you're going to get, so our low degree subroutine allows us to maintain a near exact matching in H. And H is an EDCS, so that gets a 2 thirds approximate matching in the graph as a whole. And again, for the update time, we're just going to set beta to minimize these two terms. And that's going to give us our update time. So the challenge here is the second step, maintaining the matching in H, is easy. We use our low degree subroutine. The hard thing is maintaining H in the graph G. So um, how do we do that? So this is based on a paper by Peter Kiss. This is not the original construction. This is way simpler than the original way in which we maintain an EDCS. So here's the idea. That basically what Peter shows is that you can more or less construct statically, not dynamically. If I just give you a graph and I ask you to construct an EDCS, you can do that in like linear time. He doesn't actually construct an EDCS. He constructs something a little weaker called a damaged EDCS, which is actually basically similar. It gets rid of a small number of bad vertices and throws them away and says, this doesn't impact things much. But let's just say, for the purpose of this talk, that he can construct an exact EDCS in linear time. So now what we're going to do is we're going to use the robustness of the EDCS that I just showed you. 
right? So we have our ETCSH. It has like degrees around beta. And let's assume for simplicity that it has like around n beta edges. So we showed before that that means that it's robust to like around n beta deletions, n beta times some epsilon factors. So you could delete most of the edges in the EDCS, like a fraction of the edges, and it still has a good matching. You can also show that it's incredibly robust to insertions. It's actually robust to an infinite number of insertions. And what I mean by this is that if I have any new set of edges and I insert them into both H and G, I'm still going to have a good matching. I left this as an exercise on the sheet. And so the point is that as long as you have fewer than n beta updates, H is still going to be a good proxy for G. You don't have to do anything. And so here's our graph for maintaining an EDCS. It's a, barely a dynamic algorithm. The algorithm is you compute the EDCS statically in linear time. And then for n beta updates, you just do nothing. Or technically, what do nothing means is if the adversary deletes an edge from H, like if the adversary deletes an edge from the graph and that graph happened to be in your subgraph, obviously you delete it from your subgraph. If the adversary adds an edge, you add it to your subgraph. But you don't like do any other recomputations or anything. And the point is that as long as the number of updates is less than n beta, you're still going to have a two-thirds approximation because we showed that the EDCS is robust. And after that many updates, you're no longer guaranteed that your EDCS is good, so you just recompute a new one. And what is the update time? Well, it takes linear time to compute the EDCS. For n beta updates, you do nothing, so the update time is m over n beta, which is exactly what we saw. So basically, the robustness of the EDCS kind of very easily translates to the dynamic setting. OK, this is the dynamic algorithm I wanted to show. Um, I'm going to say one more dynamic algorithm at a very high level, which is, so we have these trade-offs where the EDCS is this middle trade-off. And you might ask, OK, can we get an even smoother trade-off curve? And the answer is that between 2 and 3, you can get a really nice trade-off curve. So this is recent work by uh, Sanjeev and Sohail. And basically, they're showing, like, OK, you can get even faster update time than root n, and then you get a worse approximation, but always better than 2. And I'm not going to describe their algorithm. And let me kind of give a stylized description of their algorithm, which is a, a bit inaccurate, which is, so here we said that, OK, you have a graph G. And, but it's hard to maintain a matching M and G directly because G is just some arbitrary graph. It might have high degree. It might be messy. So we kind of have this intermediary graph H. And we maintain H and G, and then we maintain M and H. And the idea of their algorithm is to use multiple H. So you imagine doing something like this, where you have G and H1 is an EDCS of G, and H2 is an EDCS of H1, and then this is M. Then basically, now this has degree delta equals N. And here I'm going to use beta. Here I'm going to use beta is equal to N to the 2 thirds. And here I'm going to use beta is equal to N to the 1 third. And so the basic idea is that the kind of time to update things really depends on this gap between the betas. So here, this update time is going to be n to the 1 third, right? Because my subgraph has degree n to the 1 third. And you can show that this update time to maintain like this EDCS, maintaining h2 in h1 is easier than maintaining h2 in the original graph g, because h1 has somewhat lower degree. So you're kind of making it easier on yourself to maintain this EDCS by working in this higher level subgraph. And so this gap is n to the 1 third. And so you're going to end up with an update time of n to the 1 third here and an update time of n to the 1 third here. So it's not too hard to show that this update time would get, that this structure would get you an update time of n to the 1 third. What is hard to show is that this has a good approximation. Right? We said that, OK, if you take an EDCS of g, that gets you a 2 thirds approximation. Here, you're not taking an EDCS of G. You're taking an EDCS of an EDCS. And it's unclear that that gives a good approximation. In fact, that's so unclear that this is not the algorithm they actually use, because I, I don't know if it has a good approximation. But basically, they, instead of having like two literally different subgraphs like this, 
they kind of have one thing that they call a hierarchical EDCS. But at a high level, the hierarchical EDCS has edges at different levels, where it kind of has like edges, lots of edges at a high level, so that's right below G, and they have like a less edges at the level right below. So they're basically, by having edges at many levels, they're effectively kind of doing this thing where they have many layers of subgraphs. And so each intermediate step makes your approximation worse, right? Because like each time, instead of working with the real graph, you're representing the graph with a sparsifier, which loses some information. So each time you go down, you're sort of losing more information, but you can show that you're not losing too much information, and so your approximation still always remains better than one half. And so by kind of having this many layers, you get into the one-third update time and a 0.612 approximation, then by adding one more layer, you get a better update time and a worse approximation, and so on. Okay. Sahel, if you're here, let me know if this was an inaccurate summary. But, um, okay. <laughs> um, so, okay, so that was just another example I want to say about dynamic algorithm that uses the EDCS. And I wanted to highlight it to show that, like, yeah, EDCS gets a two-thirds approximation, but there's kind of work showing that sometimes you can use it to get a worse than two-thirds approximation, but make it easier to compute. There's also some work using it to get a better than two-thirds approximation, so there's some flexibility. Okay, let me quickly mention um, two things. One is, uh, Another open problem you might ask is what about a smooth trade-off between number one and number two above? That we do not know. That's an open problem. Like it's uh, somehow, there aren't really good algorithms for getting better than a two-thirds approximation. Um, okay, so let me talk about one more application. So I mentioned before that cut sparsifiers have this amazing property that they're super composable, meaning that if you have a graph and you kind of split your graph into parts, and you compute a cut sparsifier for each part, and you just kind of glue them together, then you get a cut sparsifier for the whole graph. And we said that that is really useful in like distributed and parallel models where you never work with the whole graph at once, but like, you know, a single machine just works with a small part of the graph. So let's formalize this notion of composability. So let's say you have a graph, and let's say you partition the edges. And so we're gonna have these different graphs, which each have all the vertices, but only a subset of the edges. So cut sparsifiers are perfectly composable in that if you compute a cut sparsifier for each GI and then you just take the union, then you also get a sparse cut sparsifier for the union of the, whole, the graph as a whole. What about EDCS? It's not composable in this way. If you just have an arbitrary partition and you compute an EDCS of each part and then you try to glue them, it's not an EDCS and it doesn't necessarily contain a large matching for the graph as a whole. But if your partition was random, then it does contain a large matching. So if you take any graph and you partition the edges randomly and you compute an EDCS for each part, then all of those EDCSs together are an EDCS of the graph as a whole. Okay, and this is really nice in applications where you are like in the parallel model in particular, where you can't have one machine process all of your edges and when you want to partition edges amongst many machines. So let me kind of give a vague sense of how this works. So this is the main claim that we have to prove. It's not an easy claim to prove. I actually, I left it as a hard exercise proving this, kind of in the hopes that maybe someone will come up with an easier proof because the current proof is, is very messy. Um, but the, to kind of get a vague sense of how this would work in the, what's called massively parallel computing, which is like one of the standard models people work with, is that basically you have your whole graph, you partition it randomly, you get to choose the partition, so you're just gonna make it random. And now each of these is gonna work on one machine. So you're gonna send each of these to one machine and now that machine is gonna work locally and it's gonna compute an EDCS of each of these parts. And then you're gonna send all of the EDCS you computed to one machine. And so the space here on this last machine is something like n to the 1.5. Right, because basically you, um, each of these EDCSs have space n and so combining everything, or sorry, it's like a, I'm, this is if you have root n machines. 
So you can kind of, even if you start with a very dense graph, you can somewhat sparsify it. It's not too sparse because each of these have n edges. And so combining everything together, you have more than n edges, but it's still sparser than the original graph. So that's the basic idea of how to use composability. So you can actually also use this for random order streams, because if you think about a random order stream, like you have your stream of edges, but if it's a random order, then you can take the first chunk of edges as basically if you just sort of say, like, let's look at the first, um, I don't know, n to the 1.5 edges, and then the next n to the 1.5 edges, and the next n to the 1.5 edges. These are a random partition of the edges, because it's a random order stream. So if you just kind of compute an EDCS for each of these parts, and then use this composability theorem, you will, in the end, end up with an EDCS for the whole graph. And that gets you into the 1.5 space. And once you have an EDCS, you find a 2 thirds approximate matching. Um, with some new ideas, you can actually use kind of some, you don't use composability as a black box, but you use some, some ideas about the EDCS and show that you can actually reduce the space to order n. And then very recent work by Sepper and Sohel actually shows you can do slightly better than uh, two-thirds space, again using the EDCS, which is very cool because it's a very small improvement over two-thirds, but conceptually it's kind of the first result, which is using the EDCS but actually breaking the two-thirds barrier. And the idea is that you kind of compute an EDCS, which gets you a two-thirds approximation, and then you do a little bit of augmentation to get a slightly better matching. OK, so those are kind of the, uh, yeah. I don't know of any. Yeah, like maybe you're saying like if the partition has some nice structure, then it is composable. I don't know of anything. Like the only partition I know in which the EDCS is composable is the random one. Yeah. Um, okay, that kind of finishes the main part of the talk I wanted to do. There are some other more technical parts. For example, the proof that an EDCS exists, or the proof of the main lemma in non-bipartite graphs. I definitely won't have time for that. Um, but you're welcome to come talk to me afterwards, and I'm happy to sort of walk you through those. Um, let me actually say something that uh, um, someone asked me a few minutes ago that I feel like is worth mentioning, which is, so we have this definition of the EDCS. And note that you could set beta to be whatever you want. And so the, the question of, so what should we set beta? And that depends on the application. Basically, in order for the EDCS to work, like in order for it to have a good approximation, you need something like beta is bigger than 1 over epsilon. So you know, if you want a constant approximation, you could just set beta to be a constant. And in most applications, that's what you're going to do because you want to have a sparse subgraph. So for example, for the MPC algorithm I just showed, or for the streaming algorithms and all of those, we're setting beta to be the smallest constant we could get away with. But it is nice to have it in this generality because, for example, in the dynamic algorithm, right, we were setting beta to be much bigger. Because there the idea was that you want robustness. And we said that you're robust up to like n beta changes. Um, and so if you want to be robust for a long time, then you need to set beta to be bigger. So there's some variability in how you want to set beta. OK, so that pretty much concludes my talk. So let me just make some concluding remarks. So OK, we said that we want to define a matching, matching sparsifier, uh, a, sub, a sparsifier for matching. And we basically said, like, there isn't going to be a great definition. There's a definition that's way too weak, and there's a definition that's way too strong. And so we're going to have to compromise. And part of what that means is there isn't going to be one right sparsifier. So I've talked to you about the EDCS. I showed you it's a good sparsifier. It helps with a bunch of problems, but it's not like a cut sparsifier. There are some settings for which it totally is not the right one. There are some settings for which we probably want the totally new kind of sparsifier. So I don't think there's going to be like one end-all, be-all sparsifier. But nonetheless, we showed that there is one that is quite nice. And it has a lot of pretty nice properties. So. We kind of first talked about one sparsifier, which is the kernel. And this is just the maximal beta matching. And this is quite nice to work with. But 
has this limitation, which is just it can't break past the one half approximation. And then we showed this EDCS, which has a lot of the same nice properties as a kernel, has local constraints, and is able to break through this approximation. I should say, though, that it is less nice than the kernel. Like there are, It's harder to compute than the kernel. So there is some cost to getting this better approximation. OK. Um, let me just conclude by talking about open directions. So these are going to be very general, because I haven't talked too much about like specific settings and specific bounds, because I wanted to keep it at kind of a high level of a sparsifier you can use for many models. So here are the general. I feel like, so let me kind of describe the world of matching as I see it. And the, the main thing to say is like, there is this really big barrier at a half. So getting a less than one half approximation is like way, way easier than getting a better than one half approximation. And that's still the case. The EDCS in some sense like, its main contribution is that it helps us sometimes break through this barrier, and it helps us sometimes get down to two thirds, get, the get a better approximation. But there are still many settings in which we don't know how to break a half because we can't apply the EDCS, because it's like, you know, there are a lot of settings in which we can't compute it that, that efficiently. Even the dynamic setting I showed you, it's still much slower, right? The two thirds approximation I showed you is still much slower than the like constant update time for a maximal matching because while we can compute an EDCS somewhat efficiently, we don't know how to compute it that efficiently. So one open problem is just generally kind of more techniques that get us passed into here. And those techniques could either be based on the EDCS and there's still kind of a lot left to do I think here like again, although the definition is quite old, like a lot of the results that are beating one half using the EDCS are new because they're all kind of proving new properties about it or new ways to compute it. So it is still possible to maybe use the EDCS to go beyond here, but we also probably need other tools. Okay. Um, and in particular, it would be nice to have a sparsifier which maybe like is even easier to compute than the EDCS, maybe at some cost to approximation. So I think the kind of hierarchical EDCS I mentioned earlier is a step at that, and kind of, yeah, more like that that are useful in many models would be great. Okay, and then the second direction is to go even further than two thirds. So basically in here, it kind of feels like an EDCS might be useful because an EDCS gets a two thirds approximation. So you just have to figure out how to compute the EDCS in whatever model you're working in. Of course, we also want to fill in things that go beyond two thirds. Um, and two thirds is kind of Im also, it's not like one half, but it's also a pretty significant barrier. So there are many problems for which two thirds is provably the right answer. For example, for fault tolerant matching, I forgot to mention this, but we had this sparsifier that like is incredibly robust and preserves a two thirds approximation. And you might ask, is there a sparsifier that's incredibly robust and preserves a one minus epsilon approximation? And the answer is there isn't and Sepper is going to prove that to you. But um, so there are some problems where two thirds just is the right answer. And there are other problems where we're not sure if it's the right answer, but there does seem to be like a structural barrier at two thirds. So it's both a structural barrier and it's a barrier for the EDCS in particular. So kind of one goal is can you come up with some notion of a sparsifier that's useful, but that actually beats the two thirds approximation that an EDCS gets? And I don't know the answer to that. Um, I will say there are actually a few recent results that are using the EDCS to get better than two thirds. I kind of mentioned that. But most of them are just barely beating two thirds. Uh, so I think that probably we just need a totally new thing here, a new kind of sparsifier. I don't know what that would look like. Yeah, so those are the two main open questions. Thanks, everyone. You should ask me later. Yeah, I don't, I don't remember. The, it's not getting a two thirds. I sort of forget it because it's like in the distributed setting. It's a, it's very specific, and I forget. Like, yeah, ask me later. Sorry. Yeah. What's the time of the algorithm which calculates PTS? K 
can you say that one more time? Uh, what's the time complexity of the algorithm that calculates the EDCS? Which computes the EDCS? So again, there is a linear time algorithm to compute a kind of damaged EDCS, which is like an EDCS that obeys the constraints on almost all the vertices, but disobeys it on a small number of vertices. That's published. Um, I believe that uh, there's an algorithm that gets it in linear time period, just any EDCS. That is not published, and I don't have 100% confidence in it. Yeah. Um, oh, sorry. Does any of this extend to uh, B matchings? To B matchings, yeah. I saw a paper that extends it to B matchings, but I didn't really look at the details of that paper. So I have, I think there is one paper that is doing that. Uh, I can send you the link, but I don't have info about it. Yeah. Uh, 